Hi, I'm Suze Shaner, and I'm your host today of Community Forum. And I have the great pleasure to have with me Dan Carter, who is currently the first selectman of Bethel, Connecticut. Welcome, Dan. Thanks, Suze. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for coming on. And just to let our viewers know, those who don't, that you were elected on February 7th, who's counting, um, in, a spe in a special election. Um, so five months into office, we're doing a little bit of a check in here. Um, and I do want to let folks know a little bit about your background and then get into what's going on in Bethel. So you, you have an eclectic background um, in the military, worked for pharmaceuticals for a while, been an entrepreneur, served as a state rep, um, and now serving, overseeing the town of Bethel. So can you speak to a little bit about um, your background and how it informs your philosophy and how you lead and what motivated you to want to run locally? Okay. So there's a lot there. Uh, yeah. Obviously my background, I did spend, uh, I'd say the first decade after college in the military as an officer and pilot in the Air Force, um, did a lot of traveling, but what that gave me was real, real formal leadership training. Obviously I made it, uh, I, when I left the military, uh, I was a major so I had really had a great opportunity to actually, you know, have formal training and apply it. I went to the pharmaceutical industry for about just over another decade where um, I, you know, I got a lot of background in sales, uh, marketing, uh, working directly with customers. So I think that kind of, you know, added something to my, my toolkit. And then I spent probably the, the next decade, again, working in smaller businesses to the point where I even had my own company for a while. And I was uh, back in the aviation world recruiting pilots and doing sales management training. And that was also the decade where I got involved in the legislature. Um, I served Bethel, Danbury, Reading, and Newtown as a state rep from uh, 2011 to 2017, where you know I had another opportunity to kind of apply all the things I'd learned uh, in those formative years of my life. Um, and I always looked at this role as a first selectman as something I might want to do someday. And I never knew when that would happen. And of course, uh, you know, I had the opportunity um, when our previous first selectman left to take a position for me to run last February in a special, which brings me here today. And over the last five months, you know, I think what's what's unique is that I've had the opportunity to come into a role where you normally don't have folks with a formal leadership background, um, coupled with, you know, the, the customer facing experience I had in the farmer world. And then, of course, being, you know, a state legislator for six years, you know, understanding what uh, makes our community tick, uh, where I can find resources for our community and our residents. So I think I came kind of with a, a very unique set of, of skills when I walked in the door uh, on February 8th. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 9 a.m. February 8th. So, yeah. <laughs> so if you could crystal, I, I want to drill down in terms of some of the issues that you ran on in your platform, but if you could just... Mm -hmm distill down what are the most significant things you've learned it's only been five months and some of that is just like getting the lay of the land but but if we had a gestalt on what's your key takeaway yeah. so far what would that be well a, a lot of what i learned happened during the campaign you know when when i started the campaign you know i was originally thinking about you know it's about budgets it's about you know, making sure we keep the place affordable to live and all those things were at the forefront which is true by the way but one thing I noticed during the campaign and listening to what residents were talking about, there was a real lack of communication in town. And, you know, I would talk to the kids in the schools through a, a World Cafe experience that we had, and we found out how disconnected they were from the community. And the same thing would happen with seniors who felt left out of what was going on. And then, of course, anybody, you know, downtown would realize that, you know, all of a sudden you wake up one day and there's something built in your backyard and nobody knew about it. Yeah. So it was very clear that the town was you know, you maybe have a website or have information, but wasn't pushing it out, wasn't reaching out to the community. So that was the first thing. And then the second piece was the development in town. You know, yeah. a, you know, we have a very charming New England town. It's quaint. It's one of our greatest assets to draw people and businesses here. And there's a real feeling that we've kind of come to this point where we're overdeveloping. So those during the campaign, I really found out those were the, the top things on folks' minds, in addition to keeping the town affordable. So, you know, stepping into office, that's what that was really what I started working on right away. And I, and I still learn that's true because I've done some things that, you know, have increased transparency in town. 
Uh, you know, people know what's going on. I'm reaching out more to people in town. Um, so, so Dan, let me just, let's just let's just address that for a second. Yeah. So, so being more transparent. So, what are some ways in which I want to talk a little bit about some of the ways in which you're doing that? And and just to let our viewers mm -hmm. know, by the way, first time I met you was in April, and and I I charged into your office because I went to pay my taxes on a Friday. It was like 12:30, and the building was closed, and I was like, what? Why is the building closed? And so that's how we got off. That's the foot that we got off on. And I have to say, I was impressed with, you said, hi, come on in. I was all fired up. And we ended up having a very productive discussion around a lot of topics in town, having been, you know, a homeowner for 25 years in town. Um, so that was my first experience with you. But what are some ways in which you are trying to be transparent and your different vehicles for communications if folks want to know what's going on in town? So the, the first thing that I had an opportunity to do, um, you know, we, I have a position in town hall that's actually for a personal assistant. Instead of getting a personal assistant, what I did is I brought somebody in to do communications part-time. First time Bethel has ever, ever had anybody dedicated to communications. And, and that role is all about trying to find um, content in town hall, you know, through our department heads, whether it be, you know, public works, public health, uh, all those folks who need to get information out to the community and then, you know, beef up the social media presence, presence rather. And um, I do a, a little weekly newsletter that comes out on Friday afternoons um, that, that folks in town really, really like because now they're feeling connected to some things that they might not have known before that was happening. And it so, can be something so as Dan, simple as, Dan, go ahead. Sorry, I'm going to keep interrupting you because I want to make sure I'm, we're landing on some of these things. Yeah. So if, if folks wanted to get on that newsletter, how do they get on that newsletter? Yeah, the, the best way to get it via email is just go to the front page of the website and sign up for general information with your email address. Okay. And um, and the other thing is the patch has been carrying it pretty regularly, which is great. And I think a lot of people are getting it through the patch. So those are really the two vehicles. Um, okay. You'll see it on the town social media as well. Um, so that, yeah, that's the best way if you want to find the weekly newsletter. And the newsletter covers all kinds of things. I mean, it's it's almost kind of very, it's it's easy to read. It's short. It's kind of random in a sense that you'll see things that we're doing right now in town hall. It may be as simple as, you know, this morning I went to um, a meeting for the, the center, right? Uh, you know, for domestic violence, abuse, victims, things like that. Or, or maybe we're talking about a union contract. Yeah. And then we'll talk a little bit about what's happening next week. And then I always try to give a little little bit of shout out to individuals doing something special in the community. So that's kind of the, the way we do it. And you might find, uh, you know, where we have paving coming up the next week. You know, before nobody would, would tell you what roads are being paved or what's going on. So those are the things we're trying to do to be different. Yeah, I mean, that's that's good to know. Suddenly you're driving, you're like, uh oh, there's a big, you know, de detour. So so in addition to transparency, which, which you've just covered a little bit, um, you also had a platform on four different areas. So I want to just do a check-in on all of those if we could. So, mm -hmm. you know, afford making Bethel affordable, housing opportunities, public health and safety, education excellence. So I want to start with more affordable housing, which obviously that can mean a lot of things. Um, and it was interesting. I did, I, I did a little research on some stats, which I was surprised to, to learn. Housing expenses in Bethel are 4% lower than national average, but utility prices are 33% higher, transportation mm. and gas 13% higher. So it translates to um, an overall cost of living 5% higher than the national average. So I'm curious, what is your vision for making Bethel more affordable? And maybe in there, you could also weave in a little discussion about a lot of people up in arms with the recent assessment and our taxes significantly up. Yes, yes. <clears throat> so let me let me start with the assessment real quick, because that kind of creates a foundation, I think, where, where we want to go. So um, every five years, uh, all the towns do a property assessment change. Um, what happened this year in Bethel, and I think a lot of towns in Western Connecticut is a little bit unique. I mean, during the pandemic, if you recall, uh, you know, folks were coming over the border, moving into Connecticut in droves. And if you think about what kind of house they wanted, they were looking for what I call the median income house, something, you know, between three and six hundred thousand dollars, perhaps. So what happened when we did our assessment last year, when the numbers came out, we found that in Bethel, uh, while the residential market grew pretty substantial, about 37% value, the commercial one only went up a small percent, or like maybe 15%, I think it was the number, industrial by 14%. And the, the larger homes, as you know, people weren't looking for in the pandemic, 
those stayed very, very flat. So new homes, big homes, all stayed flat. What the result was, was an actual shift in tax burden from the larger homes and commercial properties over to the middle class. So in, in, in effect, you have folks who maybe were paying $7,000 a year in taxes, and now we're paying between nine and 11. Yeah. So it was, a, it was a very difficult hit for a lot of folks because of the assessment. Had nothing to do with our budget, right? So sometimes sometimes people get confused at how the mill rate works and the budget and all that. But regardless, it was a little shift in tax burden. But then so, with respect so can, to when, yeah. So can we just drill down on that a little bit? So yeah. it, it, the shift does go to the middle class. So how, do, how and that's that's significant when your taxes are increased. Some folks anywhere from 15 to 30 percent. I mean, just looking on the Bethel chat forums. So how do you solve for that in making it for the, you know, I'll, I'll call it the working stiff, you know, people yeah. who are working really hard and, and oh my gosh, they're being hit versus the commercial, not so much. Right. Well, I mean, the, the way, the, the short-term way is, is to get more volume of commercial. Remember the, the value of commercial didn't change very much, which means we need more volume. So for instance, we're selling two properties. Well, actually we have four properties for sale in our Francis J. Clark park, but, you know, that's a big industrial park. Yeah. And uh, we've just we're under contract uh, for two of those properties. And it's a significant boom with respect to tax revenue. We have two more of those properties. We have industrial property downtown that we really should work to keep industrial. Um, we have the Berkshire you know, Park. So I think right now our short term is to keep driving the opportunity for businesses to thrive in Bethel. Right. Instead of bringing in more and more residential. And that that also is a line where a lot of folks feel in town that you know we've had such a boom in residential property or people coming in in condos, et cetera, that we need to kind of throttle back a little bit and you know manage this growth appropriately. So like well, I said, well, you know, that's a good point there though, Dan. Yeah. I'm wondering because <clears throat> managing it appropriately, um, some of the recent buildings built right across from the municipal center. I mean, to be candid, that's a bit of an eyesore. So, yeah. so that kind of takes away from the Bethel charm. So, so how did, you know, what's your thinking in terms of how growth can be managed in a way that retains the best of Bethel? And also we're talking about commercial versus the middle class, other folks who are building new homes or have much more expensive homes weren't even hit as hard. Right. Well, if you, if you look at what's happening, I mean, obviously we're, we're building a ton of condos in town. Um, even up on, on Route 6 in Stony Hill, right? There's been a lot of building. <clears throat> and I think what we need to do, number one, is you know have PNZ really understand, the PNZ board understand what's actually happening in town. You know, I get a lot more feedback because I'm in the role I'm in. So I'm trying to work more with some of the people on PNZ and the leadership so they understand what is actually happening in the community and what folks want. And, you know, when we see opportunities open up in Stony Hill, you know, we shouldn't be thinking about putting in another condo complex right away. You know, if we're doing anything, it should be a mixture between business and residential. It, that, also, that also has been built up a lot over the years. And, and yes. uh, you know, it, it gets to be too much after a while. It's like you want to see some some variation. So so also what about affordable housing? Because some of that is not necessarily on the lower end for entry point for people. Right. I, I like to talk about it in this way, that there, there's a state definition of what affordable housing in is, rather, and then there's housing that's affordable. So <laughs> if you think about it, we have, um, you know, a lot of times we'll have a percentage of the housing, especially downtown, that needs to be affordable housing by state definitions. By the way, that's still somewhat high. I mean, you could be looking at $1,400 a month, right? But then what happens is those other units in that same building come in at a much higher amount. So it ends up almost by doing as much affordable housing and the 830G properties, which we can talk about in a minute, um, sometimes that actually drives up the rent in the area. Yeah. So I think that we, we have to be very, very smart again, how we develop and making sure that we're pursuing the opportunity to have a mix between business and residential and focus on the kinds of businesses we're bringing in town. You know, like I said, downtown, I'd love to see more light manufacturing, some things like that, maybe even, you know, make Bethel a bit of a reverse commute, you know, where we use our train to get people into Bethel. But that takes time. Yeah. And I do think I, th I do think PNZ is kind of seeing it a little bit. I was at a meeting a couple of weeks ago where they were discussing a property up in Stony Hill. And they were adamant that, you know, instead of just doing a large apartment complex, that they really did want to see something that had the business element included. 
So well, I think that, that is yeah, a move forward. Well, just to step back for a second, even, even for the affordable housing, some, some of the, my understanding is some of the regulations, they only need to have a couple of units that are affordable and the rest are right. extremely high. So it, it's right. a way for, you know, developers to come in and, and do things that are not always the original intent. Yeah, you're speaking of when, when we say 830G, yeah. um, we've talked about a lot. 830G is the, the number of the statute, so there's no official name for it, but it's the Affordable Housing Statute. It's been around since you know the uh, early 90s. And what it does is if somebody comes in and does an application under that state statute to build something, they can essentially bypass local zoning. Yeah. And even in that property that they build, there's only a percentage of those that have to be affordable units. And um, that's been a big, big fight for many years. Even when I was in the legislature in 2015, we tried to combat that a little bit by allowing communities to put other things on the list that are affordable. Because yeah. in that statute, the town has to achieve a, basically a 10% uh, goal of having 10% of the houses be deemed affordable. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of places that are affordable. We've got little parts of our community, like down near Beth Page, and we have condos, we have in-law situations, which we should be looking at as counting towards our affordable housing. Okay. Okay. All right. Anything else on affordable housing before we move on to public health and safety? Um, I, I mean, I think, listen, at the end of the day, affordable housing is important, but also housing that's affordable. You know, as, yeah. we, as we move forward, we do things in this town, we have to look at both. It's not just whatever the state definition is, but yeah. you know, we really do want uh, folks to be here. And for instance, one of the things we're doing right now is uh, we're tearing down the old police department. I know people have been commenting now, but we had some delays, but uh, that is hopefully going to be a place where we can do senior housing. And that's, you know, a big part of affordable housing for our community. So hopefully that goes well. So it has that been decided it is going to be senior housing? Well, what we have to do first is we're we're working through the Bethel Housing Authority to uh, take some money aside and do the surveying and see if that's going to work out for us. Part of this you know, plan was to get the old PD out of the way and be able to survey the property. Uh, the, the property itself is in a floodplain, uh, not a swamp. <laughs> some people get up and around saying it's a swamp. Yeah. But um, we want to make sure that if we can build something there that you know, we can mitigate any risk of flooding or it looks like the property can be filled in in a certain way. So we're looking at all those options to see if we can um, you know, increase our uh, affordable housing roles. Okay. All right. So let's move on and just talk a little bit about um, what's a headline on what your focus has been and what your vision is for public health and safety. Well, you know, coming out of the pandemic, it's been interesting because, you know, COVID is still a very real thing out there. Uh, hasn't gotten a lot of attention, uh, but we also have other things to worry about. So, you know, our public health department, part of what I'm trying to do with them is just communicate more about what's happening um, for instance, this summer, you know, in a public health world, uh, I've been, been talking about something called the 101 critical days. A lot of folks have never heard of that, but if you think about it, between, you know, uh, Labor Day Memorial Day, that is a time where the most accidents happen in the summertime. Oh, yeah. So try to educate our community, uh, educate folks in town hall to make sure they're making good decisions over the summer. So to get people thinking about looking out for each other. And I hope that, you know, that mindset goes into everything else we do. You know, we offer vaccine clinics and things like that to public health. But then there's the safety part, you know, and the safety in the community is always a big concern. And there are two places I worry the most. You know, Greenwood Avenue keeps me up at night. Uh, it's very congested these days. It's yeah. Congested. Yeah. The, the big worry is in the morning, too. You know, people come through like it's a racetrack. Yeah. So we're working on some things there to, you know, do some re retrofitting, uh, putting in some more crosswalk signs, some things like that. Um, crosswalks. I'm looking at getting crosswalks up near Big Y, you know, because we really want to make sure that, you know, the community is uh, pedestrian and bike friendly. Well, that's a good point, because yeah. even Big Y, especially with all the I, I mean, I remember when big before Big Y was there, but but even not only with Big Y, but all the residential housing. So there are residents there and people do use those sidewalks. And that whole corner there has gotten extremely congested, as well as Old Hall, Old Hollyville Road, a lot more congestion and traffic down this road because of the, the different businesses that that have um, arisen there. Yeah, what happened, I think, a number of years ago, the town actually applied for crosswalks with the state. Remember, that's a state road. And I think there was a little bit of what I call the chicken and the egg. You know, the we were planning to do development up there, but the development wasn't there yet. And I think we were denied based on that. Now, as you see, we've got hundreds of families and businesses and everything up there. I think yes. this time around, we'll have an opportunity to get that done. It will take a little bit of time. Obviously, we're working with the state government. 
But um, you know, at the end of the day, I think we'll be successful in you know doing something in that area. And okay. the other part of this, I would say one other thing with safety, something we're working on right now, and we just um, we had a vote last night to look into doing a lease option on license plate readers up there, which if you think about it, you know, police cars, some of them drive around, they have a license plate reader, and every so often they pick up stolen cars. Well, one of the things that happens in our town is we have stolen vehicles, uh, people steal vehicles, <laughs> drive into town, and they rob Target or rob a business or shoplift, whatever, and then they get out of town. What we're looking to do is try to spot some of these stolen cars coming in hmm. and hopefully catch people before they do something. And for instance, we just, yeah, we just had a, uh, somebody nabbed, uh, I think it was two weeks ago by one of our officers. Uh, they took off, you know, you can't chase cars anymore. That's the big thing. You can't chase yeah. a car. But they were able to catch this guy. He had an ankle bracelet on because he was on parole for murder. So we I literally know. have somebody who went back to jail for 12 years for stealing Legos. But you never know. You, know how you, those never, know. Can go. you never know how those can go. Um, you know, one thing I just want to mention, which I, I didn't know, um, I pulled a tick off my leg a little while ago, you know, a few months ago, and I was able to bring the tick to the health department in town and they tested it just so I could know. I didn't know that that was a service. And it turns out it was a Lyme tick. Thank God I got it off in time. Oh, but I don't know if people know that, you know, that that's a service for the health department. So it's, it's interesting you say that because there are, that is a service, obviously, but there are, there are a lot of things that the town provides with respect to service. And there are a lot of things that community organizations provide. And that gets back to, you know, that's the reason we're redoing our webpage. Yeah. <laughs> that's the reason we're doing more uh, outreach. Um, a communications person is working with those departments to start driving information out to the community. So the community understands all the services the town hall provides and also get feedback on those services. You know, we talk about some of the things I want to do going forward. I mean, we have to work on our permitting system to make it easier, right? So there's a lot of there's a lot of bureaucracies that happen in town government, and the people in town who are doing this for us, you know, our our town employees are phenomenal, and they want to improve their service. But sometimes yeah. they we don't have the avenue or the, the the change agent to make that happen. So those are some things we're working on as well. Okay, so one other area I want to hit on is education, education excellence. That's another focus for you. Yeah. Well, so the, the, the first step in that is when when I stepped in on February 8th, we were right in the middle of our budget cycle. Now, the good news is that I've been on the Board of Finance for a year, so I understood and, and being around the block a little bit. But if you think about it, um, we delivered a budget, and I say we, meaning Board of Selectmen, Board of Finance, Board of Education. We got together, and, we, and, and I would also say to a great extent, Dr. Carver, Right, our superintendent, mm -hmm. and we delivered a budget that was really sound. Like we didn't, we didn't cut corners and lose people that we uh, picked up during the pandemic. You know, we had paraprofessionals and we had tutors and some folks like that we desperately needed to keep because the world was different after the pandemic. Yeah, we were able to all come together and do what is really a pretty reasonable budget, lower than inflation. It was three point eight nine percent, so pretty respectable even by what towns near us did. Yeah. Um, I think the one that was lower. DRS was Newtown, but their budget was all over, I don't know, that was 112 or 120 million. It was, they have a pretty substantial budget. Ours in its entirety is around 89 million. So in the big scheme of things, that was the first thing was to make sure that, you know, the kids in school were not getting shortchanged. Yeah. And uh, the other thing we do is, you know, we fight regularly with the state to try to get what is due. You know, they don't fund special education fully like they should be. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, this year, we did fare a little bit better with the state's educational cost sharing. So, you know, we're making progress because we have a great board of education. We have a great board of finance. Um, we have people in, in the education system here who really care about the kids and, and are doing things to make the budgets work. I mean, for instance, Dr. Carver came to the table and they found, you know, a substantial amount of health savings, which really helped our budget. So these are the kinds of things when I say, you know, education and education excellence is important. This is the direction we're going. Well, I have to say, I, I do think that there are a lot of caring educators in the Bethel system. And I have personal experience with the special ed program um, in my mm -hmm. family. And, you know, I can't, it takes a special, a special people to really focus in on that area. And you always yeah. do as a, as a parent, as an educator, always do have to be advocating to make sure that you're getting the services that your child requires. 
And there's a there's a part of that program too that I think folks aren't even aware on so aware of. I'm going to give it a shout out right now. We do a community partnership program, otherwise called the transition program. In in Bethel and in other high schools, we're required to keep high school kids with special needs till they're 22 years old. So what happens is we have a program in town hall during the mornings during the school year where we have a group of transition students basically are able to get life skill uh, you know, coaching downtown. You'll see them around town hall. Uh, they do the coffee cart on Thursdays where they're able to learn to count money, um, almost like running a small business. I mean, they're around our community. And that program saves our schools millions of dollars. Millions oh my of dollars. God, but also, also yeah. that's fantastic um, in terms of the skills and experience it gives the youth and, and also in terms of the, the care and having them out, out in the community. I mean, that's fantastic. We, we only have like two minutes left. It goes by so quickly. Um, I, I know part of your vision is to foster greater dialogue, transparency, engagement. Um, by way of these last two minutes, um, is there anything you want to say around um, how to speak to the tensions, discourse, political and social divide and trying to bring people together in our community to solve our most urgent issues? So I think it's a great question. You know, we, um, we've we all been torn apart by politics in general. There's no question about it. There's a palpable sense of anger in the community. Um, some of us coming out of the uh, pandemic, and I think we've lost our social, social awareness a little bit perhaps. But, you know, one of the things that's interesting about local government is there's an opportunity that, you know, we look at it and we're not that partisan on this level. It's really about running the town. It's about being a community, working together. Um, you know, we've been really trying hard in town hall to bring back some of the things that uh, connect us. You know, some of the events, you know, we've got the Food Truck Fridays back. We'll have the concert series um, in August. Uh, we're support, supporting all kinds of local things. The Chamber of Commerce has the Beer Fest coming up in August. Um, we're doing the drum and, circle. And I'm doing a drum, drum circle. circle. That's where I was going next. Um, <laughs> something you and I have worked on. I think it's a terrific idea. Uh, it's August 12th. You know, look online. But we're doing a drum circle, community drum circle. Of all things, it's very basic, but it's an opportunity to get people together. And then on the on the town side, you know, the the meetings and all that. We're trying what we can to kind of get people more involved. Um, I'm being transparent with some of the things that are going on. Uh, I do office hours every two weeks. I do one early in the morning between seven and eight. And then two weeks later, I'll do it between six and seven. And, you know, if, if people want to contact me, there's the first selectman at Bethel-CT.gov. You reach out to me via email. If, um, if you're passing through town hall and you've got an issue, try to catch me. Um, <laughs> if I'm not in a meeting, I will stop what I'm doing. We'll sit down for a minute and we'll talk. It's, it's super important that I think everybody in our town feels engaged what's going on um, because there's a lot happening. Yeah. And people need to know, you know, what's going on right now. Okay, Dan, listen, we covered a lot of ground, more to cover. Have to have you on again in the future. I hope so. Thank you for joining us. And I, I, I can be a testament to if you're not, you're not in a meeting, you will drop everything and listen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm Sue Shaner with Community Forum. Until next time, thanks for joining us.